Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to um, a once every month so far and uh, this is the third part of the series and um, I'm glad to have all of you take some time off from today evening in India, it's Friday evening and uh, Christopher, I know you're from uh, US so I'm glad to uh, see your presence as well. So uh, welcome again and this is going to be about uh, 60 minutes. And as the title suggests, we're going to cover uh, deep learning and machine vision in manufacturing. And what uh, we're going to have um, quite a bit of content in the 16 minutes and probably leave about 10 to 15 minutes for questions towards the end. And if there are any questions, we'll keep this informal. Please do unmute yourself, uh, ask everyone, um, and, and let everyone hear what uh, questions you may have. And I'll be happy to answer it to the best of my knowledge. And you could also use the chat window, so I'll be monitoring both. So with that, um, just a quick note about the intended audience that we had. So we had about 100 registrations. And as always, I think people might trickle in a little bit late. Um, so the audience that we have are mainly from two segments. One is from the manufacturing companies. And uh, they are mostly involved in digital transformation maybe industrial automation, process automation, et cetera. And we also have uh, machine builders and system integrators who um, provide solutions to these manufacturers. Um, so their primary um, interest in uh, this webinar is probably to augment their product solutions with, with the technical value addition. Um, a quick introduction about myself. I'm an engineer, an electronics engineer with uh, a master's in computer science uh, from the Washington State University in the, in the US. And uh, I actually did my specialization in artificial intelligence. And uh, I worked in the software industry um, a little over a decade, mostly in startups and more recently in, in, in Microsoft in Redmond, Washington, where I was um, uh, leading a program in a search optimization. So it had a lot of AI. And um, I moved back to India and founded Qualitas Technologies. And we've been primarily in the machine vision industry uh, for industrial automation. And more recently, about three years ago, we've uh, developed a product which uses AI and in uh, providing solutions to common applications in industrial automation. So I'm really excited to share some of that learning and knowledge that I've got and we'll also cover some of the practical aspects of uh, AI and deep learning as we've experienced um, here with our solutions. And so what's going to be covered in this webinar? So there's going to be three primary uh, topics. The first one is going to be um, an introduction to AI. So AI, especially in India, is very new. It's been talked about and has been uh, in the headlines very recently, but um, it's also, there's a lot of misconception about what AI and what, are, what can it do and what it can do. Uh, more importantly, this introduction is more focused on um, manufacturing. So we're going to talk about how AI is relevant in manufacturing and why manufacturing. And we're going to go a little deeper into a subject called deep learning. And again, here we're going to just talk about some of the fundamentals about deep learning. And, uh, and we're also going to lastly, uh, develop a solution using um, our Qualitas Eagle Eye. So that's a product that we have which uh, uses deep learning for common industrial applications. So we do a demonstration and walk through for a, a sample application. So these are the three things that we're going to get uh, from out of this webinar. So again, if any questions, please do stop and ask me on either on the chat or on um, by unmuting yourself. So before we get started, a little bit of history about uh, manufacturing, right? So uh, when we talked about manif keeps thrown out a lot and you know as an introduction industry 4.0 actually came about as you know what is referred to as the fourth industrial revolution uh, the first industrial revolution that was you know back in the 18th century was really about mechanization and i think the first example 
uh, or the instance of mechanization leads led to from the textile industry where they used a power loom uh, to actually use some kind of a mechanical loom which helped in automating a lot what, what was earlier a very manual process so that was kind of the first uh, instance of mechanization which uh, started and it took about a hundred years for probably the next uh, industrial revolution which was um, started by you know the famous Ford assembly line and so there you know things were being mass produced there was a lot of automation electrical energy was a huge driver and impetus in enabling the second industrial revolution and things were uh, it was a big employer so manufacturing then became a serious uh, employment opportunity and this was um, you know just before the world war uh, that happened and then it, it kind of started to in, uh, gain momentum even after uh, the world war and, and a lot of industries, a lot of industrial hubs started to emerge. The third industrial revolution was mostly with electronics and semiconductors and how you could use computing in your uh, industrial processes. So things like PLCs and SCADAs and you know, automated process controls and of course you know, software. Cloud also was just starting to make its way in the uh, late 19, 90s, which uh, you know, with uh, software as a service and cloud platform providers, which started to offer MES systems and things like that online. So today, you know, early 2000s to maybe 2010 or so is what we're calling the fourth industrial revolution. And um, and as you can see, the the gap between the industrial revolutions are really shortening. So in other words, what earlier took hundreds of years is now being transforming in a matter of a decade. And that's primarily because a lot of the uh, underlying infrastructure and technology has enabled these intelligent use cases and systems to really skyrocket and mushroom, right? And so what is the fourth industrial revolution? It's really about connected devices and how you can use the internet, which has become very ubiquitous in enabling uh, connection of various devices that then lead to uh, providing a very smart factory with an interconnected and smart factory. And so you may have heard many terms in, in industry 4.0, IoT, AI, and they're all basically referring to the same thing. So they're all components in this bigger um, concept known as industry 4.0. So the, um, where does AI fit in, right? So now we've heard about AI, and, and again, this is related to manufacturing. Um, AI is, um, is projected to be a huge financial driver. So whenever you see these large numbers being thrown about, there's obviously going to be a lot of interest and there's going to be a lot of uh, innovation that's happening when there's a lot of business opportunity. And so what we're talking about is, you know, just in terms of the intelligent manufacturing market, um, this is a study by Gartner. It shows by, you know, 2020, which we're in right now, somewhere around the $65 billion is going to be just the manufacturing market size in terms of components. So in terms of any industry providing uh, services, products in um, intelligent manufacturing. And the value that's going to be generated by the adoption of these technologies is um, you know, so something like 50 times higher. So $3 trillion, $2.9 trillion. And that's the study from Microsoft that's come out, which is um, you know, was making the headlines. So that's the value that people are going to realize from adopting AI technologies in the manufacturing line. And one in three, so there's about 30% of companies are uh, planning to implement intelligent systems over the next course of the next year. So this was in 2019. So in 2020, basically 30% of all industries in manufacturing are going to adopt some form of AI. So it's a matter of time before everybody is going to be using AI in manufacturing, right? So it's never before has something like this probably, you know, uh, even robotics has not seen such a penetration, right? Robotics is is where I think about 8% of industries is where robotic penetration is. But when you, when you talk about something like AI, where the penetration is going to be in the high 90s, pretty much any industry is, you know, going to be a practitioner or user of AI by the, by the end of 2030. So every industry is going to be using that in some form or the other. So it's going to be that common. And so it's huge. There's no, there's no doubt about the impact in terms of economic value, but what does that actually translate to, or how does that, um, where can you use this, right? What are the applications of AI in manufacturing? And there are pretty much the plenty, and here are some, and there is actually a nice infographic, which uh, I'm going to uh, 
share with you in in in, um, in a blog post if you're following my blogs. But basically, it's in demand planning. So you know, supply chain forecasting, product development R and D, inventory management, production. You know, quality control. We're going to talk about that process control, maintenance. It's predictive maintenance, safety. So cameras. You know, which are looking at um, people movement, etc., close to uh, hazardous areas, and then also energy management. So these were the applications that came out of a very um, extensive survey that was done by uh, Capgemini. And uh, what it also um, sort of boiled down to is the top two applications that um, came about was really in maintenance and quality. So among these eight, uh, maintenance and quality were the top two use cases which were either being looked at very actively or were successfully implemented, right? So. Um, those are the two that uh, really uh, top the list of all the possible use cases in manufacturing. So if you see the numbers, maintenance is about 29% and quality is about 27%, which I think is uh, you know more than half of all the use cases that uh, people looked at. And there's probably a reason for that because these two um, have the biggest ROI as well as this directly impacts. So quality is something that is one of the key drivers of any competitive um, USP of, of a manufacturing company. And so that's probably the reason that it tops the, you know, in the, in the list. So, um, so let's look at these use cases in a little bit of more detail, right? So when, how do you use AI in maintenance? Um, and the, the first uh, step is, you know, um, as I said, AI and intelligent manufacturing is all about connected devices and use of data to make decisions intelligently with that data. So you have a lot of data um, and, you know, how do you arrive at actionable decisions based on the data that you have? So the first step is obviously to um, do some kind of learning from data in the past. So we've collected a lot of data, especially from various sensors or MES systems or any kind of uh, digital uh, data that's stored in, uh, from your past uh, production uh, history. And then you, you, you build some kind of a predictive model. Then you use predictive analytics to say sensors from plant equipment continuously collect data. And it is then analyzed using some kind of a, you know, AI model will we'll cover some of the, the details of what I, what I mean by AI model or machine learning. And then based on that, you're doing some kind of a predictive analytics to say, you know, how, what would be the likelihood of something breaking down in your factory or where would the next breakdown occur based on the past data, which correlated with previous breakdowns that you've had, right? So the benefits obviously are going to be high uptime and availability. And uh, there's the you know, an acronym OEE, overall equipment eff effectiveness, which is likely to be increased. So it's all about how do you uh, maximize your efficiency of equipment. And that's also going to drive down your maintenance cost. And uh, of course, that will uh, reduce your downtime and loss of production. So that's AI in maintenance. Now look, look at something which is more closer to home and what we specialize in at Qualitas, and that's um, AI in production quality, right? And so the basic steps is you have a bunch of uh, pro uh, products, parts, which are in an assembly line or being manufactured. There is a camera which is uh, using its uh, imaging sensor, capturing images. Now you have some kind of a AI system which is trained based on previous uh, images, the training data as it's called, and, and that uh, AI system is used in some kind of a predictive analytics. It makes a prediction about whether the part um, is either defective or it's uh, of a good uh, quality part. And based on that, some decision is made and an action is taken to uh, segregate a defective part of the high quality part. So the obvious expected benefits are improved product quality, reduced cost of inspection, and um, it'll also be uh, quality assurance cost, right? So, you know, you, you can reduce manpower and automate this uh, with uh, these systems. So now, and what does it take to implement such a quality control system in machine vision? So there are um, a number of different parts that you actually would have to 
pay attention to. So it's not only about software or not only about a camera, which is uh, sometimes uh, a misconception that people have. It's all about the camera. It's all about the software, which uh, it's a lot more to that. So when you when you talk about machine vision, you have something known as a pre-process automation. It's it's what is the mechanical and camera automation that's required for actually capturing the image, right? So you need to make sure that you have image da uh, consistent data acquisition. Uh, the next part is obviously the image acquisition itself, because without the um, let me see if I can use my pen here, without the image acquisition, you you don't have the data to act upon. And an image acquisition itself has a number of things camera has a number of different parameters that you need to pay attention to. But once you've acquired the image, then you process that image using some kind of a software and that's the image processing that happens. So it's software algorithms that take a digital image and, and, and arrive at some kind of a judgment or a result that you're looking for. Now, with that judgment or a result, you will take some action and that's your post-process material handling. You need to segregate the part, you will pass the coordinates to a robot that may pick it up the, but there is some action that, that happens. Otherwise, you know, it's not just for data capture. You're, you're trying to automate something. And in order to um, connect all the pieces together, you have a communication module. And that's how do all these different devices communicate. Because the vision system is another part to the larger intelligent factory with pop into important. So all these elements go about building um, or developing a machine vision uh, system and solution. So today, we're going to be focused on this particular area, which is the image processing. And image processing, again, has two different um, computing paradigm. What is you know, traditionally known as rule-based or heuristic-based algorithms, and then uh, what is now uh, more popularly known as AI-based algorithms. So we're going to cover, zoom in a little bit on the AI algorithms that um, enable a lot of these processing that happens in machine vision. So before we get into uh, the details, some definition and terminology. So I mentioned AI a lot, but what really is AI, right? And I think uh, this is a, a good, I've seen a lot of slides and definitions, but this sort of summarizes this very succinctly in terms of what is AI versus machine learning and, and deep learning. And uh, it particularly, I think it uh, uh, hits a little home, home to me because as I said, I did my master's in the early 2000s. So. Um, as early as, 2000s, I would say AI was largely relegated to uh, research institutes, large enterprises, and it was far from being adopted and mainstream. The penetration of AI was very, very small. And but the origins goes back a really long way. Since the time, you know, there was a Turing test, which the famous Turing test uh, designed by Alan Turing, who said, you know, if you can uh, develop a machine that can fool a human. It's thinking that the machine actually is a human. And so uh, that if, if the machine passed that test, it was known to have passed the Turing test. And that was um, you know, the origins of coin. And I think that was the early origins of the term AI. Um, uh, the concept of machine learning. And machine learning is nothing but teaching systems, teaching these computers to um, think intelligently. And that process was when uh, there were new algorithms, new papers, and a lot of research that was done that made this possible, um, which in the, in the 50s. Um, is my audio OK? Uh, by the way, I can hear some disturbance. I hope I, hello? Um, it, are you able to hear me now? Is that OK? OK, okay great. All right. OK, OK. Yeah, um, I'll request everyone just to mute their screens, just uh, mute their uh, audios. Uh, it looks like there's a little bit of disturbance. Uh, okay. So uh, let, let me, uh, I think there's somebody not unmuted. Yeah. OK, so the um, yeah, so I talked about machine learning, which is nothing but training machines or computers to take intelligent decisions. Now, uh, in the 2010s, and that's where you know the first 
concept of deep learning started to really emerge. And what is deep learning? And deep learning was nothing but a more advanced form of machine learning, right? So um, earlier you had a lot of uh, intelligent algorithms that could teach machines to do certain things, which in order to replicate human intelligence, right? So maybe to play games like play chess or to um, look at uh, anything. Excuse me. Uh, gaming was, a, was an example. Um, another example was also traditional computer vision where you would look for um, defects uh, using certain um, uh, algorithms that match patterns from good parts, um, either to classify or to find defects, etc. cetera. Um, but deep learning kind of took it to the next level, right? And by the next level, I, I meant where it was really replicating human intelligence. So before deep learning, things were still, the humans were still far better at taking these decisions. They were not consistent, but when it came to the actual raw intelligence, if you gave it um, a problem to either, you know, reading a string or to identify a defect, the humans would still be better at it. Maybe if you gave it a thousand such examples, they would make mistakes, and that's only because of fatigue or distraction or boredom. But the intelligence, the raw intelligence was still far superior when it came to human. But deep learning kind of broke that tipping point, the threshold of human intelligence. And you actually had algorithms that were far more intelligent than what a human would, would, would have, right? And a very famous example was, you know, in, in gaming, when the first system actually beat uh, an AlphaGo champion. And, and, and the uh, AlphaGo was a, a very complex game, which um, had tremendous amount of cognitive intelligence that got applied. And uh, the uh, a a deep learning system trained by Google's um, algorithms actually beat that hu human champion. So that is just one example, but there are many more. And what, um, I'll just move to the next slide. So, so, you know, one of the ways to kind of put this in perspective, right, was, you know, what is known as the uh, ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, ILSVRC. And it's nothing but the World Cup of deep learning, right? So just like you have the Cricket World Cup or the FIFA World Cup, there was this very famous challenge, especially among the AI community, which um, had a data set of images. So something like 5 million images. And the challenge was to look at each image and then classify it, you know, recognize the image by, by giving it, you know, if it saw an elephant, it had to say elephant, right? And it, it went a little deeper. It said, you know, elephant on grass versus elephant in water, right? So it was that tags that you needed to come up with. And back in 2020, you could see that the top five, so among all the participants, the top five error rates were somewhere around 26%. So that means 26% of all the images were misclassified. So one in four were misclassified, and that's back in 2010, right? And that was the start. Now, and these were using traditional computer vision, very advanced computer vision algorithms, but they were still, you know, traditional computer vision algorithms. And the the stuff in light green from 2012 onwards is when the emergence of deep learning started to come in, and you, and, and see what happens at the error rates, right? The error rate starts to really exponentially come down here. So the first deep learning algorithms almost you know, it, it was just above 15%. And in 20, the, the very next year, it improved by another, you know, 40%. And it started to drop significantly. And what happened in 2014 was it started to beat the human intelligence. So the human error rates at that point was 5% challenge because even humans made errors in, in, these, uh, in this complex uh, visual recognition challenge. And so 2015 onwards, it just surpassed. It was so easy that pretty much a high school kid could write an algorithm that could beat, um, you know, that five percent error. So what, you know, the world's leading scientists and you know researchers couldn't do in probably 2010, 2011, uh, with you know the most advanced supercomputers, a high school kid has been able to do just six, seven years down the line. So that's the rapid rise of uh, technology that has happened in deep learning, right? And so that's probably one of the biggest drivers as to 
why it has now started to become very exciting in pretty much any industry. There's not a single industry that I can think of where deep learning or AI cannot uh, find relevance. And it's because of the incredible accuracy that you can realize in terms of potential. So really what changed? What was the reason for this um, uh, complete transformation? Um, and the, the primary reason was because of the large scale digitization that was happening, you had access to a lot of data, right? So you had big data was uh, key thanks to uh, a lot of these social networks, access to um, mobile phones with cheap cameras, and people were capturing images, sharing it on Facebook. So now a lot of these big five tech companies suddenly came up with lots and lots and lots of data. So they had this wealth of information and this, they, they could play around with that. So, and uh, the next thing obviously was, what do you do with the data? You needed to have enough compute infrastructure to be able to process the data and experiment and build algorithms and, and uh, to actually crunch the data to form some you know, intelligent inferences. And of course, the algorithmic process, progress. So it was, you know, along with the computation, you needed to have uh, algorithms, which was then able to the software part, basically. And that was, you know, what you call convolutional neural networks, uh, deep neural networks, things like that. And uh, so computation was also spiraled by the large um, you know, availability of uh, GPUs, which was, you know, mostly consumer GPUs, which was used for gaming and uh, video graphics and things like that. Um, so the trend, you know, of course we all use Google, right? And all that is great, these trends, but let's look at really what is, what do you learn from Google? What do people, uh, what, what do people search habits tell us about, you know, how deep learning has been trending, right? So I just looked at, you know, the deep learning trends and I, I found something interesting, at least when I look at India as a market and when I look at this worldwide. So I just ran this yesterday. So this was from 10, 2020, so the last seven years. And you can see the interest over time. You know, it's kind of been flat, but back in um, 2016 onwards, it's really spiked up. This is worldwide. It's kind of gone up and now it's a little flat, right? So I uh, found that interesting, but I looked at the same pattern in India. It's it's still on its in, in an upward trajectory. So I think if I look at sort of when it hit the 75% mark, this was back in 2019, whereas here it was more closer to a, a year or two years ago, if I looked at the timeline of, of hitting um, uh, back back here, right? it's much later in India that it kind of hit that 75% uh, mark. So, um, and I think that's what I've been seeing as well, because um, trends and adoption and comparing it to India, we are probably a couple of years behind, two, three years behind. But today it's gaining tremendous interest and you can, and, and uh, Google also tells us. And yeah, there's always when you look at any new emerging technology, and this is called the Gartner uh, hype cycle, right? So any new technology sort of goes in different phases. There is some innovation trigger. So there's a trigger that kind of um, causes people to wake up and say, wow, okay, there's something called AI or deep learning. And, and that, starts to get people interested and what do people do they usually start to read attend conferences understand um, you know what what is this technology about right so when i first heard of blockchain for instance i was what the hell is blockchain and what that means ai because you know i've been studying this and i've been in the industry i probably had you know some uh, base information about what this was but something new like blockchain was probably there was some article that i read and that was the innovation trigger for me and then what happens then everyone starts to talk about it and then it really peaks it peaks up to a very hype and everyone starts talking about it and they start throwing numbers and and what Gartner calls the peak of inflated expectations and so you think you're going to change this these these things are world changing technologies which will just do you know the, the robots are going to take over the world uh, you know things like that so we're probably somewhere in that uh, range when it comes to me it's it's this is a little outdated but three years ago we were probably at that peak and you, you could see headlines like oh you know our, our robots going to take over the world kind of things. And that's was really more hype than start to prototype. They start to um, do POCs and they really start to implement some of these in their assembly lines. And then they realize, oh, wait a minute, this is a lot harder than I thought. You know, it's, this is thought it would be, it's a lot more complex or a lot more understanding is required to implement this. And then you go right down to what is, is known as a trough of disillusionment. And then you start to lose hope. No, this AI thing really doesn't work. This, this stuff is not for us, right? 
And then what happens, then there's maturity that starts to creep in. There are more companies that start to uh, drive innovation. Um, infrastructure starts to get more stable. And then real world applications start to emerge. And you start to see real uh, value that's coming out of these implementations. So we have to speak in India. So what, what I see, there's a lot of hype. But then people want to convert that hype and translate that to reality. So management comes and says, you need to drive you know, an AI project as part of your KPI. And then people start to run POCs. And when they do, there is uh, uh, hyperinflated expectations in terms of what value you'll get. And that quickly starts to drop down. But then the, the good thing is then you, 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 sh you shouldn't stop. You need to continue with the innovation. And then you start to get where then you start to improve and you start to see some light at the end of the tunnel. And then you start to really plateau in terms of the productivity you're going to get. And that's when you're going to learn, okay, where is AI more applicable to my manufacturing line? Where is it more, um, you know, value adding? And, you know, what are the, some of the things that won't add that much value, right? So uh, and that's, I thought was an interesting perspective. And, you know, it also shows where we are in this cycle. So, now let's talk about why deep learning and the huge amounts of data. So in earlier algorithms or earlier approaches, um, the more data you threw at a problem, there was, it never moved the accuracy needle. So it never improved. So traditional computer vision or computer machine vision algorithms peaked with maybe 10, 20 samples or 10, 20 images that you could train some kind of heuristics algorithm. But that was not the case with deep learning. The more data you threw at it, the better it got, right? And the, and, um, the other uh, twist side to that is the more data you have, um, sometimes the algorithms, the deep learning algorithms, became complex because you had to handle so many different permutations and combinations of conditions. So you started to see complexity, whereas deep learning didn't increase in complexity when you threw more data at it but you still gained from the performance benefit. And so that's why deep learning really started to become very popular. And I'm showing you a small demo of what I mean by that, of how you could do a very simple step to train something quite complex. So that was one of the primary drivers. So when it came to traditional machine le learning, I think the key part to this was, um, you know, you did have intelligent systems, but there was this big step, what we call as feature extraction that was still very cryptic and scientific uh, problem to classify something as a car or not a car. And what you had to do is you had to take images of car and there was a step of feature ex extraction, which maybe separated the background from foreground, right? So you had to do that manually. And once you did that, then you had to then look at, okay, what are the different features in that car, which might be correlating to it being a car. So that could be the wheel. So you had to identify a feature called the wheel, right? And you had to do that manually. And then you could then have a system learn that automatically to come up with the output. Whereas in deep learning, this whole step was eliminated and you could just put, give it an image of a car with a label that says, this is a car and this is not a car. And the system figured out what features were relevant. That probably was um, why deep learning really started to gain popularity, right? So the increased data as well as the ease of training were probably the two reasons why it's very popular today, right? So, um, but the question is, you know, how much data is really sufficient? And today, the limiting factor with why deep learning systems are not as popular still is primarily one, yes, you do need a lot of data, and that's thousands of images, but there are a lot of techniques that we can adopt, like transfer learning and, um, uh, single shot learning, things like that, SSD kind of algorithms, which reduce this data, the appetite for data. And, um, and the second reason is probably high computational cost and the availability of cloud and the infrastructure available on the cloud reduces that barrier as well. So we are, I think, at a threshold where deep learning is just set to really uh, spike in adoption because of these two reasons. So, you know, how does this deep learning algorithm work, right? So it's, it's basically a deep, as, it, as the name suggests, it's a deep uh, neural network. It's a very um, traditional neural network with many, many layers. And at this, at the, I'm oversimplifying this, but you can think of, you know, let's say this is 
um, an algorithm you're training to recognize a human face. And the human face um, has many uh, features. Um, and each layer is sort of learning a particular uh, feature, an edge, or a, or a particular type of shape. So in the first layer, you're probably looking at pixels related to edges and shapes. In layer two, it puts these complex shapes together to form maybe parts of, a, of the face, like the nose, the eyes, the ears, etc. And then, you know, further layers down the road, it puts it all together. So now each, and, and this network of layer are million of, millions of nodes uh, large, and each one is kind of looking at a particular feature. So when you look at a million nodes, imagine the number of combinations and permutations that you can actually learn. And that's what makes it, you know, really interesting and powerful, right? Um, but at the heart of this is what we know as learning, right? You got to teach the machine to learn um, these kinds of features, and the um, it's a very simple concept in terms of machine learning and training the system to identify certain um, things that you want it to identify. So you just give it a bunch of labeled data. In other words, you give it um, examples, right? So just like you would teach a human or a five-year-old, you, you, if let's say you wanted to teach uh, a kid to read and say this is A, you would give it examples of letter B, you know, written in different ways, and, and then uh, the child would figure out that, okay, this is a B. And then after having given it enough examples, it knows, it learns, right? It, it, it creates a neural net, it, it creates some cognitive memory in terms of recognition. Um, and that's a learned model. And then when you give it unlabeled data, which is doesn't have these examples, it comes up with a prediction. So that's the basic concept of learning, right? But the actual implementation is a lot more complex than that because there are many techniques of um, how learning or machine learning uh, can be used. And, and there are f you know, four which have a lot of papers and research material out there. The first one is known as supervisable training data. That, so the example-based learning. So you give it examples of A, examples of B, and then the system figures out, okay, now this is the, these are the features, and this is how I would recognize the letter A, or this is how I would like recognize the letter B. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, is, is, is the other extreme. You give it no information at all. You just give it data, right? And the system sort of figures out it learns based on no input at all. And it does that by recognizing patterns, right? So a common example is if I give you, for instance, if I give you two different unique animals, you've never seen these animals before, so as a human, right? But I give you 10 images of an amphibious animal or a, a, let's say a, a reptile, which you've never seen before. And I'll give you 10 images of a bird you've never seen before, but based on, some patterns you would figure out okay these are all reptiles you won't be able to particularly recognize them but you'll be able to separate the two out and you'll you can kind of learn the difference between um, the birds versus the reptiles right so that's nothing but unsupervised learning semi for supervised is sort of a happy medium between the two where you give it some labeled examples and then you give it a lot more unlabeled examples and then it figures out as a combination now what's uh, excitement is reinforcement learning so this is um, more like you give it a lot of examples and you then um, give it a, 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 an indication of a reward, which is, it's like, uh, this is, these are how gaming systems are thought, where you give it a combination of moves, let's say in chess, and then you know, okay, this results in a win. And the system learns that based on the result of a win, these are the moves that are most optimal for leading to a win in a game of chess. And so then it starts to get better and better and better as it plays more and more um, games. And that's reinforcement learning. So let's look at these examples, right? Supervised learning is nothing but you give it an input with an example and you see uh, a response or an output. And you give it both the expected output and the input, which is the training data, right? So what's the example? So let's say you give it an example of an email and then you also give it a tag, the output that says, okay, this email is spam or not not spam, right? So if you give it enough examples, like thousands of examples of email, which are spam, and then you give it a couple of thousands of emails, which are not spam, then the system will then slowly start to figure out what is a spam email and what is not. It starts to derive common patterns between 
these two uh, classes. Another example, you give it an image and then you give it a tag that says cat or dog. And if you give it enough examples, then, then it starts to learn and be intelligent enough to identify you know, unlabeled images and classify them as cat or dog. Right? Similarly, an audio clip with a text transcript. So you record a little audio and then you give it the transcript in text. That's a, uh, ASCII data. And you give it enough examples, it then starts to, you, you start to train um, uh, a translate, an automatic voice recognition system. Or the reverse, if you wanted to give it like a automated, uh, a robo voice system, you give it some text and a recorded voice, and then you teach the system to actually speak out given some kind of a text. So that's, those are unsupervised learning. Now let's look at unsupervised learning. And in unsupervised learning, there are a couple of different, um, you know, uh, uh, algorithms, I would say, or objectives. And as I mentioned with the earlier one, um, the, the clustering, anomaly detection and association. Clustering is nothing but taking a bunch of data and then grouping them into similarly grouped uh, objects. So that's called clustering. Anomaly detection is you give it um, a bunch of, um, let's say uh, it could be uh, defect, it, it could be in machine vision as well. You give it, you know, millions of good examples, and then it starts to train, it starts to learn what is a good example, and then it starts to look at what is a deviation, what is the anomaly. If you then gave it something which was um, a defective part, and association is nothing but um, what are the associated um, elements related to a target object. And this is common shopping. So it's used a lot in e-commerce where you, if you buy, let's say, uh, milk, what are the associated products that could lead the user, you know, an unsupervised learning technique called association. So for instance, in clustering, you give it a bunch of images, like sports people, and without any examples, you would not have thought this system before, it starts to group all these similar examples together. And that's a, a common form of uh, supervised, uh, unsupervised uh, training. Anomaly de detection, let's say you train it with a bunch of images of oranges, and then you gave it an apple. It will then notice that based on the previously trained images of only oranges, that this one is looks very different from the previous set. And then it says, okay, this is an anomaly. And it learns that without actually having seen an apple, uh, an example of an apple during the trading phase. An association, as I mentioned, is you have an item set and what are the uh, associated items that frequently get bought together? And that's again used in uh, shopping, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, Semi-supervised learning, it's, it's used a lot in medical imaging because to get actual training labeled data is very expensive, it's very hard. So you give it you know, enough unlabeled models uh, on, uh, and, a, and a common semi-supervised uh, technique is known as um, GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. And this is again a, something that's really hot right now. And basically it's nothing but you have two models. And the purpose of the first model, which is the generator, is generating data, right? So let's take an example. I think a, a famous example was um, of um, a model that created Picasso paintings, right? So it, you had a generator model that is generating um, examples of Picasso art, and then you have another model which its only job is to look at the data that's being generated by the generator and then be able to classify whether it's real or fake, right? So it's a discriminator model. So, and that feedback is fed. So if it gets it right, then it, uh, there's a back propagation back to the generator and it learns, okay, you know, I was able to dis distinguish the fake versus the real. So it tries to uh, do a better job at uh, fooling the discriminator and the discriminator is learning very hard to really um, identify the difference between a real and a fake based on a given data set right so uh, where is this really useful is to take something which uh, let's say you have a very low resolution image and you want to create a replication of how the image would have actually looked in very high resolution right so a model like this you give it enough um, low resolution image along with uh, the high resolution counterparts and then it starts to figure out that um, the whether the high resolution image is real or fake whether it matches the low resolution input um, to you know what it would have actually been another common examples you might have seen on the internet is a uh, voice spoofing right so you train 
um, a, a voice generating algorithm that can speak like uh, Obama or Modi, right? And so having uh, and another one on the internet, which has research from University of Berkeley that took an image of a horse and then converted to a zebra, right? So it's really generating data and it's generating data based on this concept of the generator and discriminator concept. So um, a, where it is used very commonly in machine vision is um, in creating training data, because as we said, um, deep learning is data hungry. So the more data you can generate artificially can make the system more intelligent. So GANs are used in training data. So I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip a bunch of uh, the reinforcement learning part, uh, which is in gaming. And I'd like to dive into an actual implementation of how you can build a solution. And we'll do that with the Qualitas Eagle Eye, right? So the Qualitas Eagle Eye is nothing but a system we've developed here at, um, uh, in Qualitas, which has, um, it's a fully uh, integrated solution which is a deep learning powered solution. It has three parts. You have a fully integrated camera, which is the image acquisition module. And the image acquisition module comes with different lighting, camera, lens configuration, et cetera. So it makes it very easy for you to take an application, swap in a dome light, or if you wanted a ring light, and in, in a space constraint, you can use a small spotlight um, uh, module instead. So it's, it's plug and play kind of lighting. And you can also plug in you know, any camera resolution that you want. So it's a very configurable image acquisition system that can just go and fit into your assembly line. And with a sensor, you can start capturing data, image data. The second part of it is, is the vision controller. Uh, oops. The vision controller is um, the device that's sitting on the manufacturing line that's um, consuming the images from the camera. And it is doing the inferencing or the prediction, right? So these two are basically what's sitting on your manufacturing line to do this inspection. So it's it's equivalent to a smart camera or a PC-based vision system, right? Um, but where does this intelligence come from? And that's the training app. And so for that, we have the uh, Qualitas Eagle Eye Cloud app, which is a web application where in the first step, all these images are transferred to this application. And you use a very easy to use training application to configure uh, your inspection solution. And then you can do a one-click deploy de deployment from the cloud directly to this edge controller, right? So you can just drop this neural network into this device and then it starts to uh, do intelligent prediction. And then it's also a closed loop system where you can take uh, the images are then graded is using again an AI-based algorithm. It, it identifies uh, possible candidates that could have cloud app and present it to a human grader. And then it, it uh, asks the human grader, either quality inspector or system integrator or one of the, uh, you know, a domain expert who understands, you know, what the inspection is all about. And then it, he can quickly with one click judge, okay, is this graded correctly or was it misgraded? And based on that feedback, the system is retrained, right? So it's a kind of a closed loop system, which uh, quickly gets you to a very high level of accuracy um, compared to something which was traditionally being used right and the four modules we have a class is to classify an image so given an image it identifies is it of class a b or c some uh, different brands of a certain uh, package to see if um, your um, you know any mix-up has happened in an assembly line so if you if you try to identify just uh, the different classes it, it knows that okay this is not class a um, and so you would identify this anomaly real quickly. Similarly, you know, identifying bearing variants. So you have different bearing variants. You want to match the, the bearing image to the part number. So you can train it a classifier with enough examples of this variant. And it, you can teach the system to identify which part it belongs to or what the part number is. Um, another uh, module that we have is object detection. And object detection doesn't just classify an image, but it identifies an object within that image. So an example is a refrigerator shelf. So here you have you know, different parts in a refrigerator and you can train it to identify the object like the cabinet or the, um, the mini egg, this, this egg tray over here, um, or this ice cube tray, which also belongs to that. And it's very simple. It's just bounding boxes that you draw with the objects. You give it enough examples and the, and the uh, system will learn how to detect these objects on its own. OCR is a very common example and to read, um, you know, strings, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. 
and flaw detection is to look at anomalies you know any kind of surface defects etc which uh, you would be able to recognize so um, let's look at an actual example so we'll do a very simple uh, appearance of uh, wheels and you know they all look different and the objective is to identify give it an image and identify which variant it belongs to so you know we're going to start with a simple machine learning which like i said supervised learning you give it examples with late tra training data then you're going to teach the system and the the output of the training is what is known as a model and the model is then um, tested with some input data and you are going to see a prediction and evaluate the result whether that's okay or not okay right now the first step in this is to actually uh, collect the data so you need to collect all the different combinations and permutations of the images and so uh, for that you know you need the eagle eye inspection module that's or any kind of camera that's been placed on your assembly line and then you collect the data and store it to be later used for training and once you've collected that you need to then label it as we said this is supervised learning so it doesn't learn on its own but it, you have to give it labels but it's very easy to use uh, labels and um, I'm just going to stop this and then take you to the application. Okay. Um, can can everyone see my screen with the login? Okay. So this is our uh, uh, the. Um, the application on the cloud. So once it's connected, uh, as I said, you, you first um, deploy the device on the assembly line and what it does is it starts to collect training images. And so here I've, I've got a particular solution that's already been uh, created and for a demo and it's got all these images of different wheels, right? Now here, the training part is as simple as, uh, let me move this. Yeah, is to go here and then just tag it to say if it's zero to eight, zero to seven. Oh, there are nine variants. Okay, so zero to eight, nine variants, and successfully. So you do that with enough images. You go to the next one and you say this is number two, right? And you've uh, saved the label for the next image. Um, you can then. Uh, there is a verification step available. So one of the things that um, is uh, happens often is that when you're dealing with large images, especially for complex applications, and when you don't want to send it to a very inning uh, process until you've made sure that it was actually labeled as a one. So you can go through a verification process, just verify all these labels, and then say it's okay. And then you take it to a training process. Now the training process is nothing but you know you uh, it's it happens on the on the cloud. You, you create, you select which model that you want. You can retrain, you know, when you, if you've already trained something before, you can uh, use that model file to improve it. So, you know, you don't need, it, it need, need not be a training from scratch. And then you have takes the input training images and then creates multiple artificial images to make the models to simulate all these different conditions. So to say, you know, to rotate these images, to increase the brightness, to make it smaller, bigger, you know the shear uh, things like that um, and and then you know at the end of it it creates uh, a, a model file so the training basically takes um, anywhere from uh, an hour to sometimes you know 14 hours to even 20 hours depending on the kind of model intensity and data that you have but this is all on the cloud it's using state-of-the-art uh, tesla v100 uh, gpus 
from on, on Amazon, etc. Uh, let me quickly go through a couple of other examples because it's um, so you know. Similarly, you can have an object detection, which requires a little bit of a different training approach. So here, let's say the objective is not just to identify the wheel, but to identify holes which are present on the wheel or the uh, what is what is the valve uh, tube. <coughs> I think the net work is a little slow today. Okay. So I'll zoom in a little bit. You can see that you know I've drawn boxes. So essentially, what I need to do is I can go here and then uh, draw a box around these and then tag this as a lug hole, right? And this is actually a valve, so I can go and label this as a valve. And if I give it enough exam model that recognizes lug holes and, and valves in a wheel, right? So no programming, just simple examples, point and click. Um, now, you could also go a level deeper and look at pixel level classification as well. And that's what's called as segmentation to identify all the pixel boundaries between a rim and a tire. So I can go ahead and actually use, you know, uh, draw a, a circle or, you know, which identifies the exact region of a rim. And it's, it's able to, identify it with you know the pixel level details not on the rim and i'm going to classify this as a rim right and i can also use you know polygons so i can just go here and then start clicking the boundaries of this like zoom in And uh, yeah, I've only done half of it, but I could uh, do the entire uh, wheel surface and, and tag it as the wheel at the tire. So, so what it does is it learns the pixel level features, and it's able. To, um, so, let's get back to yeah, and. So what's really happening kind of in the background is that it's uh, let my slide here is then it builds a model which basically starts to the wheel variant it is. So you give it an image and then it goes through this complex neural network. It then gives you a combination of uh, one to nine. So th that's a training that uh, in hours or however long inferencing which is the prediction actually takes milliseconds and it's operation and so that's the reason why once the training is and have this be done in, in split seconds without much um, uh, that's pretty much what I had for today's webinar and I a couple of minutes for uh, questions so I've not had any during the attend um, during the webinar but hope you're still able to follow me and you're able to catch the audio and video without any technical issues. Hey, Raghavah. Raghavah, this is Christopher. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, hi, Christopher. How are you doing? It's been a couple of years. Um, uh, yeah, one thing you know, is just this uh, training time, training hours, hours generally. Which, uh, you know, everyone says the same thing. But do you see a day when, um, not maybe the time so much, but just you know, a guy in the factory floor who's not necessarily Technically proficient yes. can go yes, through sorry, the process. Yes, sorry, Christopher. Yes, uh, apologize, but I think the audio was very unclear in the beginning. So could you could you start oh, okay. from the beginning again? Yeah. Sure. Um, one of the one of the challenges we have these days uh, is the training part. Okay. So you know you have to throw hundreds of examples or thousands of examples and takes one hour or fourteen hours through the training yeah. and Forgetting for now the time it takes to take the training, which is just that's you know processing power, or whatever. 
uh, I, I see as a block it, you know, ideally you'd like to have a guide that's halfway floor who's not a technical guy necessarily saying, hey, Joe, here's, here's a new product we're going to launch next week. Can you go through and train on this so that it'll be part of our data set? And is that really there yet or is that something in the future, you think? Yeah, no, I, I, um, one thing that's the, the stark reality today is that the, the biggest bottleneck towards any deep learning implementation today is not computation or algorithms, it's really data, is the data management, the, the data preparation part. And, you know, we've deployed a couple of hundred deployments and I would say, the data preparation by far is about three fourths of all the efforts because data preparation is not just the beginning of the training cycle, but it's also the, the effort that you would then spend after you've deployed your first model to fine tune um, to the required uh, accuracy. So what we built is actually, um, and what we've found is that the reason why uh, these uh, timelines extend needlessly is that you are not, you don't have a data preparation strategy. So in other words, um, you are going in with a lot of um, unclear or you're not going in with full clarity around what your training requirements are, your training data requirements are. So what we've done is for instance, we've um, built a simple tool uh, during the data collection phase that gives you uh, the ability to, for instance, classify these uh, training images based on different results and different combinations of uh, variations that one would see. So then when you analyze the training data, then you know that, okay, now I've got hundreds of, let's say there's a new model or there's a new variant, you know, going by your example, that has been uh, developed. By the way, can you still hear me? It's yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it's not just that one variation um, or hundreds of images of that one product that you need. You may need different variations in terms of defective, not defective, or you know, if it's let's say an assembly verification part, you need to have different combinations of parts that are missing or present on the assembly. And uh, so what, you, what one could do is we can sort of build a training data matrix and really go prepared saying that I need to go and fill my uh, different uh, cells in this combination of this data matrix. I need a hundred examples of each of these, right? And you can then give that to uh, a line supervisor or a quality guy. And as long as he has the clarity, he's going to be able to do that uh, fairly quickly. He can create these anomalies or create these examples. Now, once you have sufficient examples of these variations, then you can use, you know, data augmentation and create these uh, further uh, images or, you know, many more images out of these small subsets uh, to create your larger training data set. Right. And so that's, so we are, um, moving towards that because now as we get more and more experienced with uh, using these and the practical challenges that you have with data. So we're building, and these are all non-AI based solutions, which you just, it's, these are more um, organized way of collecting your data. Now that's, that's just the process. Now, but there are techniques you could also use for um, building models that are not as data hungry as well, right? And there's a lot of new research that's going on and it's just going to uh, be more and more widely available where you can build very intelligent and accurate models based on maybe 10 samples of a given image, right? And it learns from the previous samples and you just need 10 more. And we are sort of moving towards that. The good news is that um, as an industry in machine vision and manufacturing, um, we don't need to uh, innovate and solve those problems. These are being done by Microsoft and NVIDIA and you know, researchers in all these big 10 startup companies because these are problems that are 
um, relevant for any industry. And that's the beauty of this. So what um, we can leverage the research and the uh, innovation that's actually happening and all you need to do is adapt it to your industry. So going data optimal learning approaches, uh, transfer learning, those are all techniques that are now getting more and more mature and accurate, which will apply for an industry like ourselves. So I see that happening like you know, in less than a year's time, where it can okay, be thanks. very easy to use. Good, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Rakawa. I'm Neville here from Apollo Bias. Yes, hi, Mr. Neville. Good, good to see you. So uh, I have a question here uh, regarding the... Uh, 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 you, you had shown a few examples of tires and uh, fitting into that, I mean, recognizing each part of the tires. Yeah. Now we are looking for a solution where we can uh, a kind of uh, a tar inspection system where we can learn the defects in a tire. Now which is being done visually and with feeling. A person is doing that, he looks at the tire and uh, sees the visual defects. And then uh, also he feels it. Now, uh, looking at only the visual part, uh, there would be around, uh, say, uh, 30 or 40 kind of defects, some of them which occur very rarely, and a few of them are recurrent in nature. Now, if I have to train, say, let's sample of, uh, say, around uh, 50 type of defects, mm -hmm. and if you have to train, uh, typically, if uh, 50 types of defects, and even in this type of defects, there could be variations, which, which, which a human being can easily detect. Yeah. Whereas when you are using an image to detect these kind of defects and the variations in that, a lot of combinations should come in. Yeah. How much of processing power? Like, uh, what? How many samples of uh, this kind of uh, images would be required to 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 train, train a an accurate model? model? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with Anomaly detection, these are typically the practical challenges we faced is uh, anomaly detection is typically uh, slightly more challenging than others. And it depends on two factors. One is, um, and when it comes to anomalies, right, there are two kinds of anomalies if you actually see it from a machine algorithm perspective. Now you have, let's say, a certain finish that's given to the tire, and then you see these deviations from the standard finish. And those are you know, what we call as, what the machine sees an, as anomalies. But from a quality standpoint, these anomalies are further subdivided into acceptable anomalies and not acceptable, right? So the type one, type two sort of anomalies. So the first factor that any kind of uh, anomaly detection algorithm depends on is how many of these uh, acceptable anomalies are there, which look very similar to uh, actual defects. Uh, so because if the distinction between these anomalies are very small, the acceptable one and the unacceptable one, then it becomes more challenging. You need more data, right? But if it's very visible and it's the contrast and the characteristics is uh, distinct, very distinct, then you need less images. Right now, the good thing is about it. This is not. Uh, you don't need to run through any complex algorithms. It's it's really very intuitive. It's very human-like. So when you see these images, the the test you need to do for yourself is: Have you defined defects which are very easily recognized and distinguishable between for, for a human inspector? And if the answer is yes, then you're likely um, not going to need a lot of images. You don't need thousands. Hundreds will be enough, right? The second factor that determines uh, the complexity of any kind of anomaly detection is the size of the defect, minimum size of the defect in relation to the feature, the, the field of view, right? So if you have a very large field of view, and in relation to that, if you have a small percentage, which is the minimum defect size, then it's likely going to be a much more complex training uh, intensive process it requires a lot more data and a lot more epochs to train. So um, we've done things which um, require a few thousand images and typically that's the average size of a training data set that we uh, utilize.
but I mean, you could yeah, try to solve I, I and look at some of the real images. That, but but I, I just gave you a general answer. I hope that answers your question. Right. And uh, when you do a training, you have a training set. Usually, these images are taken under certain uh, preset conditions. Uh, yeah. But when it comes to the test set, uh, when it comes to the uh, the actual uh, uh, sets which where we have to find the anomalies, the the images could differ a little bit. Like one of the examples, like what you said, was the field of view, and there could be difference in lighting. There could be difference in the angle of view. So uh, all these factors are uh, taken care by the algorithm in case of an anomaly detection, or uh, or it requires more number of uh, samples to. Awesome. Yeah, the first thing that you know I would typically advise, and you know I had shared that infographic at the very beginning of the presentation where um, I talked about you know the different parts of the machine vision. Right now, um, I would highly recommend that to. You know, now AI, of course, is powerful, but that doesn't mean you need to really test the strengths of AI in, for all the different conditions it could uh, uh, you know, work. So by what, what I mean by that is if something can be controlled physically by, let's say, lighting, if you can actually have a consistent lighting environment, right? Now, let's load on the AI system. Right, which uh, one uh, less variable that uh, that you would have to um, deal with when building the algorithm. So, as much possible, try to control your physical environment to make it as consistent as possible, and allow and unleash the power of AI, you know, where it really needs to be used. Right, and that, from our experiences, has been the best approach um, to take because uh, it's it's simple to control a lighting environment right you can it's simple to control the orientation if you have an assembly line of course it really depends on your condition but um, when it comes to factory automation is a mass produced you can build simple automation to ensure this consistency in both image acquisition and the um, environment surrounding uh, the Im image acquisition but to answer your question, AI in theory can adapt to various lighting conditions, various orientations. You know, that's really the power of AI. But um, that power is proportional to the data it requires. So it comes with a catch. It's a rider. So you need to give it enough data. There is some amount of work you can do to artificially simulate these different lighting conditions. And that's where the data augmentation techniques come in. We do that, but um, as much as possible, try to control your physical environment. OK, thank you. Yes. Thank you for the question. Any other questions uh, before we wrap up? Anything on chat? Let me see. So there's um, the, how many programming softwares are there in the end? Natesh asking how many programming softwares. So by programming softwares, are you are talking about algorithms, Natesh? Or I'm not sh sure I understand the question. How many standard uh, uh, commercially available software? Because if it is algorithms, then you know there are thousands. There are all kinds, and every day there are research papers and algorithms. If you if you're a, uh, a AI practitioner, then you can just go to GitHub and just look at how many papers that are being published out there with, with source code, right? But if you're talking about commercially available software in manufacturing, uh, industrial automation, so as far as I knew, many of them do all the standard machine vision software companies have. Uh, AI based algorithms today, but when it comes to true deep learning in cloud, for instance, um, it's I've only um, I, I'm aware of Qualitas as being the only one that has a fully integrated cloud based um, offering. But for uh, on premise training offering, many of them have um, you know Cognex, um, uh, Teller and Dalsa, which Christopher also has, I know there's a deep learning algorithm that 
is is present in Sherlock. Um, so there's is quite a few. So it's it's a very common approach. So I think that's all there was in chat. Uh, hi Raghav, it's Naveen here. It's a long time. Yeah, hi, hi Naveen. Hi. So, uh, can you give any insights into motion amplification, which is used in predictive uh, or maintenance? You know, in a deep learning, uh, you can use deep learning to make a motion amplification system or similar. Any idea? Um, when you say motion amplification, you're talking about time series analysis, so basically time series data. Uh, no, not time series exactly. The motion amplification. Motion video, so you're talking about video analytics. Ah, uh -huh, video, yeah, video analytics. Yeah. Where let's say uh, there will be some motor, a motor base, motor will be having a nut and bolt. So you'll be having a camera which will be uh, live, la, okay. live video capturing it. So if there any vibration, it will catch. Like in After some that in the level. Um, actually, I have not gone into any of those details. Yeah. So when it comes to video analytics, it's actually a very challenging because you do have to correlate time series along with that, right? Because vibration uh, yeah. is in relation with previous images. Yeah. Exactly. Whereas when it comes to just images, you're taking a static image and then analyze. light. And also, yeah, you need high FPS camera, lighting condition, those things and all have to be taken care of, I guess, in video. Um, yeah, that's the data part. But in the analysis part, you're, you're actually analyzing a window of images. It's not just one static image. Because yeah, right. it's in relation to the previous frame that there's some movement and that yeah. indicates vibration. Yeah. As if it's static image processing, it's a single image that you're just looking at and that has no correlation with the previous image. So yeah. it's a little bit more complex, but uh, you know what I know of is NVIDIA has a very powerful library called the DeepStream SDK, mm -hmm. which is meant for these kind of an an analysis, video analytics, which looks at time series image data, video data. Um, you might want to look at that. Okay. But okay. I'm not sure if they have anything specific to vibration. Okay. 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 And also, when it comes to uh, you said there, you talked about Eagle Cloud, right? So in that, how do you ensure uh, the final inference time? Uh, let's say I'll be needing uh, some below 100 millisecond inference time. So and also I need to use some, let's say, latest uh, ResNet or any other uh, model, transfer learning model. So how do you ensure the inference time yeah. with the limitation of certain GPU? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good question. So. In, when it comes to uh, inferencing, um, well, we work with two uh, different hardware, the Intel architecture and the uh, NVIDIA architecture, which now both these offer some kind of an optimization um, uh, runtime, right? The so Intel has the open Vino SDK and then the NVIDIA has its tensor RT runtime, right? Now, what we do, our models are compatible with both, right? So that's the first thing that optimizes the inferencing time that you use. Okay. Um, the second, um, so what it basically does is it takes all the unused layers and then it crunches it to form the most optimal model based on what uh, you know it's, it, it sees as part of the optimization. Um, the second part is then really a trial and error because you have to run it because again, when it comes to uh, NVIDIA, you have the Jetson Nano on one end, and then you have the Tegra and the TX1 and the TX2. You have higher end uh, yeah. inferencing hardware on the other. So yeah, yeah. unless you test it out, you won't really come up with a, a very predictable way of knowing which what is the inferencing time for which hardware. Okay. So the other thing is just to go and build it and test it out. So you need to have these devices. The good news is the inferencing devices don't cost much, right? The SDKs cost. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So basically, you will, be using, uh, you will be using uh, tensor cores. Uh, as you said, uh, tensor RT, tensor cores for the more optimization, let's say floating point 16 or floating point 32. Yeah, uh, mixed precision is what we, well, yeah. float, FP16 is you know, now recommended because the accuracy and the uh, reduction is actually very, very negligible when it comes to applications like 
industrial automation, right? Because when you're looking at very uh, data constrained or environment constrained environments, mm-hmm. FP16 hardly makes a difference, but you see huge advantages in terms of inferencing and training times. Yeah. So we mostly use FP16 instead of uh, mixed precision, but, uh, uh, and that's another way you can optimize your inferencing time. Okay, okay. Um, for, for, yeah, these devices. Okay, okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Navi. Yep, um, hello, Kashyap. This is Navi here again. Uh, I, I think you are basically more into kind of uh, image processing solutions uh, in Qualitas. Uh, am I right? That's right. That's right. So we do right, inter- okay. image processing for industrial right. So which are the m- m- mostly widely used platforms that you, that you are using for image processing? Like I've uh, heard of uh, a lot of things like TensorFlow, Keras, or uh, SciPy. Uh, I mean, some are for data and some are for uh, uh, image processing. Uh, what, what, which one do you use mostly? The kind of platform that you have? Um, we use um, we use all of them actually. So we are we are a team of um, our R and D team is about uh, thirty engineers, out of which there are about twelve data science engineers, and we experiment with all platforms: TensorFlow, ONX, Chainer, PyTorch. Um, so it really depends on the model that you know we are evaluating and what the platform is built for. Um, but you know the platform is really not. It's all becoming democratized, right? So every the models that you get today are really cross compatible with different uh, platforms, right? So it's really at the end of the day how you stitch your pipeline together, right? From data ingestion, data preparation, uh, pre-processing, and you know the whole pipeline. That's really what um, is the key of of optimizing your entire workflow. And uh, we found when it comes to um, implementation, we are we're pretty much proficient. But at the end of the day, we 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 have our own platform stack that uh, that we use when we finally deploy these models. But for experimentation, we use all of them. Okay, thank you. Sure. So, um, yeah, I guess if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank everyone again for attending, and I'd be happy to take any questions offline. Please do email me. I think you would have received the invite over an email. And uh, we'll be doing these webinars once a month. Um, you know, so please do leave me any kind of feedback in terms of the topics you'd like to hear or any feedback in terms of what we could do to improve this. So, you know, we really want to educate the community, first bring in the manufacturing community together to uh, sort of um, educate them as much as possible about the possibilities of AI and machine learning when it comes to these use cases. I think there is this tremendous possibility and I hope uh, you know all of you took some value out of uh, today's session. So thank you once again. Have a great evening. Stay safe.